we're going to talk about what we do with our time. I did open a little bit in, in first service talking about opportunity cost and time and what, what you do with your time, right? We've all got limited resources. That's just the bottom line. And it depends on what you're going to do. You can either have this or you can have that. Okay, that's it. You can only have one or the other. From the richest to the rich, who maybe get a few more of this or a few more of that, but even the richest of the rich down to the poorest of the poor. Don't get both. You don't get both. You can't have your cake and eat it too, right? It's one or the other. The reason for that is because we're all limited by time, mainly by time, right? We all have time, and that's it. No one can change time. And resources. And maybe some of us have different resources, but I don't just mean money. It could be your connections, ideas, people in your group. I have been blessed by the Lord the last almost six years up here now to meet a lot of people because of my job. And so I have a lot of connections. So there's times that the Lord will put something on my heart, and I think, yeah, Lord, we can, we could, we could run with that, right? Because I know who we could call. I could call this person or that person. That could be a resource. And then I have other people that have lots of money. I'm like, yeah, we could do that. We've got the financial ability. But somewhere, we're all limited. That's just the bottom line. And, and what I do, what I can do, what I can gain, what I can accomplish, they're directly linked to those time and those resources. I can only do what I have time and resources to do. There's only so much time in a day. There's just That's just the truth, right? And you can give up a little sleep. You can sleep a little more. But the things that happen in my life are directly related to my resources and my time. The question isn't if we have the ability. God has created us in his image to, to be creative, to be, to be big, to do things, to imagine. The question isn't this morning if the people in this room, if you guys, if me, if we're able to do whatever we want, to get what we want. I'll be honest, I can kind of get whatever I want. In a sense, I have these resources, and I know if I want to put these resources into this, I'll get it. There's not much that's going to hold me back. God rarely intervenes in a way like some people have purported. He'll just, you can't do that because God won't let you. When was the last time you saw God intervene in the Bible and didn't let something happen? God makes choices difficult. He swallowed up Jonah when he refused to go to Nineveh, and he spit him out three days later, but Jonah still could have gone back to Tarshish. He did not have to go to Nineveh. When he kicked Paul off that horse and blinded him, Paul still could have gotten up and said, I can't see, but that just makes me angry. I'm going to walk even further from you, Jesus. But he didn't. God never just picks someone up and grabs them by the head and says, this is where you're going. It doesn't work that way. Because he's given us free will, which is what makes us most like him. But what he does, believer, what you and I are going to learn today, hopefully, is since we have the ability to do whatever we want, just do whatever you want. How do we make those choices? How do we chase down God's resources? It made me think of, of a restaurant example. Okay, let's, have you ever been to a restaurant with just a huge menu? They just, you get there and you're on page 46 and then the waitress comes by and, and she's like, hey, are you guys ready? You're like, no, I, how many, 90? Hang on, I haven't even seen the whole menu yet. You're going through it and you're going through it. There's so much to choose from. And then there's In-N-Out. You ever been to In-N-Out Burger? My in-law side of the family loves In-N-Out Burger. It's their, their thing. If there's an In-N-Out within 100 miles, we might just veer off where we're going to make sure Google took us through the In-N-Out. It might not have been on there, but we're going to go. But when you go to In-N-Out, the menu says, burger, fries, shake. That's it. There's just not a whole lot of options. They're doing it on purpose. They've decided we're not going to make it complicated. We know what you want. This is where you want to spend it. The world, the world says, listen, you can do all this with your resources. You can go here. You can go there. You can get lost over here. The way is broad. Boy, you can go down the road and you get lost. The difference between believers and non-believers is <clears throat> we take all of those resources, and instead of going to the 96-page restaurant menu, we only have Scripture. And Scripture only says this. You may do good to your neighbor. You may love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We, don't, we only get burger, fries, and shakes. And that's okay because we know what comes with it. So what we're going to do is look at the value of God's word and look at how it is that we, we choose 
where we put our resources and what we should do with them. Our main text today is going to be Matthew 13, 44 through 52. If you want to turn there, it's up on the screen. Matthew 13 is where we left off last week. I'm just going to read the first two verses for a minute. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is, this is the value of God, of Christ, of Scripture to us. The time, notice the time spent in these is never a question. The person searching for that hidden treasure, the, the person going through the marketplace, looking through all this stuff, finding that great pearl, they're never checking their watch and, oh, I'm almost, ah, I got something more important to be. I've only got an hour today to look. It says they went. They just went for it until they found what they were looking for. And then they sold all they had to get it. It, it was worth everything. There was no question. There was no question. There was nothing else worth doing. And what we can do a lot of times as believers is we can, we can come into church. Right, we can come here and say, I, I love Jesus. I love his word. I'm all about the Lord and whatever he's got. And then at some point, the Holy Spirit presses down a little. You might look through your checkbook and be like, when was the last time I, I gave anything to the kingdom of God? You might start looking at your day planner and flipping back a month, two months, three months. When was the last time I spent some time doing something for the kingdom? You might scroll through your Facebook posts. That's the worst, isn't it? Or Instagram, if you do that. It brings up your memories from a year ago. And the last year's memory is you at the bar. Like, what's up, bros? And you're like, wait a minute. I'm like, oh, oh i got to take that out of my feed. That's not what I want to represent. But it's, this is reality. At some point, we say we love Jesus. We say we're willing to search that field for that treasure. But it's really easy to see when we're really, when we're not. What our time is consumed by my favorites, I'm going to pick on them a little bit. And you know, I'm not going to heaven to meet Peter. But I'm not going to lie, it'll be fun to meet Peter when I get there. And I hope he's very forgiving. And I assume now that he's made perfect, he is. Because I pick on Peter a lot. And I think Bible teachers pick on Peter a lot. Because Peter's a great example of kind of a bumbler many times. Until he has this change of heart. And here's this great spot. Peter says, I believe. And the Lord says, but. Luke 22. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Indeed, Satan has asked for you. That he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Sorry, Peter. Listen, here's Peter's response. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Ready, Lord. We know he wasn't, right? The very next one was Peter. Jesus tells him, listen, Peter, listen, listen, Peter, calm down. Calm down. You're talking to God, Peter. Come on, let's get real. You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Today, today. Of course he does. We're willing. Are we saying I'm ready to go to prison and death? And then a little bit of a struggle comes and suddenly we're like, ah! And you're off the wagon of, of Jesus. And we're right back in where we thought we were. The hard part, believers, are we, are we really ready to forsake the worldly pleasures of life? Are we really ready to search and search and dig and scrounge and go through that marketplace and pick up everywhere and look under every table, look in every box and say, where is what I'm looking for? Are we really ready? And then when we do, are we ready to invest liberally? Liberally. We start to dig into today's message. It's really about investment and resources. Okay, I want to I make clear the value of God's word. We talked about that last week and the week before. It's been kind of a theme for a minute. The value of God's word is incomparable. But we're going to look at investment and resources. As we look at the scripture today, God's economy and mine are so, they're vastly different so many times, right? And I need to get my economy in line with God's economy. It just, it just has to. It has to. I'm going to fail miserably every time. Look at, look at Mark 12. It makes me think of this, this woman, this heroine of Scripture, and who she is and how she represents who we should be so well. Mark 12. Now, Jesus sat opposite the treasury, and he saw how the people put money into the treasury. Many who are rich put in much. 
And then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which makes her quadrants. And he called his disciples to himself and he said to them, Surely, see, this poor widow is put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance. But she out of her poverty put all she had, her whole livelihood. This woman came in and said, Listen, time is up for me. I mean, you got to look in context at this widow. As a widow, she's already in a bad position in Israeli culture. She's, she's not able to earn income for herself. There's an assumption that's probably a little bit up there in age because of the way they paint the picture of her in the rest of the Gospels. No one's helping her. She doesn't have a son or a, an, a brother, an uncle, or someone else came beside her and took her into the treasure or, or even paid the tax for her. There she is on her own. This is kind of, this is her moment. So listen, I don't have anything left. I have nothing more valuable except these last two mites. That's all I had. But the Lord reveals to her the value of all she has is investing all of it back to the kingdom. So she does. And Jesus, hey, hey, psst, psst, psst. did you guys see that? Did you guys see that? They're like, well, Jesus, I just gave last week. Said, I know, you know, your giving is not bad. But you're giving out of the not. Listen, I'm on salary. I get the same paycheck every two weeks. Rain or shine, go to work or not, get sick or not, work extra, work overtime or not, I get the same check. Really easy for me to say, I'm just going to give the church 20 bucks every week because I know it'll be back again in two weeks. This woman didn't know where the next two mites were coming from. That was the importance of investment to her of God's word. What she does is she proves that she loves God. She proves that she has faith in our Father. Look what James 2 says, right? This, this call to believers. Was not Abraham our father justified by the works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? That's a sacrifice. Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? Stop right there. Don't read anymore. Did you hear what the Bible just said? It said that, do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works his faith was made perfect? There's a lot of talk about works nowadays. I know it's the big dissension among a lot of evangelical and, and non-denominational and this and that in churches. And people, works, 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 works. Where is your faith in God without works? You can tell me and I can tell you, Tom, blue in the face that I trust Jesus Christ. But my life is what's going to show it. My life. I'm better than that. My faith only grows when I do works when I allow God to do works. My wife and I are taking on a new project currently. We're not sure for how long. We're, we're part of Safe Families. We are, we are approved foster parents through Safe Families. When Claire and I first got married, we just had Jasmine, and we wanted more children. You know, Claire came with Jasmine. She's my stepdaughter, if you didn't know that already. And so she was about three when we started dating and five when we got married. And we thought, oh, well, let's have a bunch of kids. We'd love to have kids. And by year two, no kids still. So we said, well, maybe we'll, we'll be open for adoption. We, we just want to have kids. We felt that was the call. We want to be available. And then we got pregnant. Then we got pregnant. And 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 we got pregnant. And we got pregnant. And we got pregnant. And so God answered those prayers. But the, the desire to be available never left. The desire to watch our faith grow by saying, God, yes, we understand you'll care for us. We understand you'll provide. And then he sends that fire a year and a half when we lose our home. And he gives us our new home. We get in this new house, and Claire and I went right to task, saying, Lord, we know you gave us this home for a purpose. What should we do with it? And we started praying and thinking and going to the drawing board. So we'll just start inviting people from church over. And people in the community that we helped when we were doing the cleanup will use this home, God, that you gave us to make new friendships. And God said, that's good. That's a, that's a good deed. You do that. But he had a bigger plan. And two weeks ago, for the first time, we got our call. And they said, we'd like you to watch a, a young boy for the day. And they called Claire. And so she watched a little boy for the day. We thought, oh, that was fun. And then they called us on Thursday. They said, we've got a mom that's going to have some, probably some incarceration. Would you guys be willing to take a three-year-old and a six-year-old in? We've got room. And they came and did our home visit and said, it'd be great. 
It's just this test for us constantly. And we're so excited that God has, has provided all we need to be able to provide for those around us. And we're watching our works make our faith perfect. Because we have to step out that way. And scripture was fulfilled back to verse 23, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. But you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. This widow didn't need to be there. She had right to ask someone else for support. The Bible said so. The Bible says, widows and orphans, true, pure, undefiled religion has helped them. This, this widow said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I know I, I have the right to ask. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go give the last of all I've got. You know why? Because she knew. Not hoped, not thought maybe. Ah, she knew. Knew that God was going to provide for her. God was going to take care of her. She knew the value of who her God was. Are we there yet, believers? Are, are, are we waiting to make that first step over the line? We're just edging closer to it? Just do it. Just jump over that line. What does Mark 10 tell us? It says, so Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, right? With struggles, with trials, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and last first. He's promised to take care of us. He's promised. So let's say we decide, okay, God's word. I've decided it's, it's worth it. It's worth investing in. It's worth investing all I have in. Let's just let's put a nail in that box and shut it and say, I'm, I'm agreed. We're agreed this morning. God's word is worth it. God's works are worth it. I would like to be part of what God is doing. How? Where? Who? What? Right, this, is, this is the question. This is what we're going to look at in the rest of that verse this morning. Where is the need? Who? Who? Who's the need? How should I invest? What should I give? Should I just give it all to the church? No, I wouldn't do that. Let's just be honest. If you just give it all to the church, you just say, I'm just going to take my paycheck, give it to the church, and let them deal with it. That's the easy way out. I'm just going to be really honest. If you haven't stepped over the line yet of giving regularly, not just to the church, but to anywhere, in any form or fashion, trusting God with your finances, not only are you missing out, but you're really not even just taking the easy step. It's just money. It's just money. You can go get some more. You can go earn some more. You can go get another job. It's just money. When my wife and I were at, we were at a church in, in El Cajon, California, and our church came up with this big production they wanted to put on. It was supposed to be the last three days of Jesus' life, from the marketplace and the capturing him in the garden and walking him through and going to Caiaphas' house and the false trials and the scourging and the beating and the march out to Golgotha, hanging him on the cross, taking his body, laying him in the tomb, and his resurrection. We had this, it was a big church that, that we were first married at. It was old, like a Safeway or some building, so tons of room and 15,000 square feet and outside and inside, and just this huge setup. It was a huge walkthrough play we did for the community. And when our church came up with it, I'd only been a believer for like two years, and I remember the pastor coming to Claire and I and saying, do you guys want to be involved in this? And I said, yeah, I'm going to take the easy way. I said, yeah, we've got some money. We'll put some money towards the production. And somehow, somehow that pastor knew. He knew what was wrong with my heart. And Jesus had already spoken to him. He said, no, 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 no. We don't want your money. We, we got plenty of money. Someone will give. Don't worry about that. We want you guys involved. We want you guys to put your time into it, your resource. You. I was like, ah. Oh. That's a terrible attitude. So you know what I got to do that first year? I got to play Barabbas. I had no lines. And my only scene is at the mock trial with Pilate. He says, who should I release to you then? Jesus called king of the Jews or Barabbas? And all the people shout Barabbas. And I go, Rrr! and then they walk me off stage. I'm like, that's all you got. 
over the next five years, we were involved, and by the fifth year, I was directing it. But the very first year, well, I just got to be Barabbas, no lines to memorize, no nothing to do, because I had a terrible attitude. My wife wrote the script. My wife got the honor of taking all four Gospels and spending months trying to take all four parts of it out and make it into one cohesive story for all the best parts that we wanted to represent. It's like, man, because she had a good attitude. I just wanted to throw money at it. But if you're not even willing to just throw money at it, come on, believer. It's time. It's time to go way more than just throwing money at it. So who, what, where, when? Back to our main text, Matthew 13, verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. It was cast into the sea and gathered, some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore. And they sat down and gathered into the good, into the vessels, and threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes, Lord. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. This is so rich for Jesus' followers. I'm just going to pull out one verse right now. This is kind of the main topic for today. Verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet, was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind. Fishing and farming. Huge topics in the Bible. Constantly in the Bible. They have some things in common, right? Why? Why do they use them so much? Well, because they related to the people of Jesus' time very well. They were fishermen. They were farmers. It was an agricultural society. This would have been a good way to relate. But they have something so immensely in common that maybe we've missed as believers. Do you fish? We have a lot of fishermen here. We've got a lot of fisher women. We've got a lot of fisher people. We have a lot of farmers. We've got people that do that sort of thing. When you do it, you know, what do you do if you're a farmer? You open that pack of seeds. And, well, I don't know, 100 seeds, and you look at it like, yeah, you start poking through, like, that one looks good, that one looks good. I'll, I'll put these three into the ground. I'll put the rest on the shelf. I don't need those. And I'll just till up over here a little bit and put them in. And then maybe nothing comes up. No. You go out there with the hoe. And you scratch up every single square inch of available garden space. And you take every single seed and you cast all of them into the garden. And you water all of them. Because you don't have any idea what the return will be. You don't have any idea. Your only job was to sow as much as you can. Because you know what's going to come up. Right? My wife planted these little pots. We're doing some gardens in our backyard. And she has little cardboard pots and she put a whole bunch of seeds in each one. And only like 40 or 50% of the plants popped and came up. I don't know what happened to the rest. Maybe we pushed them in too deep. Maybe they didn't get enough water. Maybe they're too shallow. Maybe these weren't viable seeds. But we invested all of it for the chance that it might all produce. What about fishing, right? What about fishing? You take that dragnet fishing like Jesus is talking about. If you've ever been out dragnet fishing, you like this, you're like, oh, no, not there. Oh, no, not there. I don't want to cast it too many times because then I'll just have to pick through so many fish and clean my net. No, your hope is to go home with a big, huge load. You're like, whoa, whoa. And it gets heavier every time. You're just dragging everything you can drag up into the boat. We'll get to the sorting. The goal right now is to get that net out there and pick up as much as you can to drag all of it up to the surface. They're investments in the unknown, right? I don't know about you, but I can't see underwater. I mean, I guess you could, if you wanted to scuba gear to look for fish, I don't think they'd stick around and wave for you, right? And I can't look at the soil and think, oh, that soil looks like it's got great humic index. I don't have any idea. Just, I, I invest into the unknown. And that's what we're called to do. Look at, look at Luke 19, the beginning of this parable. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, do business till I come. What I like about this is he doesn't say, show up at nine and bring your resume and your financial portfolio, because I need to know what kind of investor you are. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make decisions based on whether I think you're worthy to invest my goods or not. He just calls the ten, says here, and he gives them all the same. He says, go and do business, period. Go and do business. He just invests. 
So what he's calling us to do is to invest. We are his investments. And by the same token, we go out and we just invest. We're going to pick on Peter one more time. Look at Acts 10. Then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked them, for what reason have you sent for me? Peter's been shunning the Gentiles. And then God gives him this vision with this sheet that comes down. And there's all sorts of stuff in there that Peter's not supposed to eat according to the laws of Moses. I can't touch that stuff. And God says, get up and kill and eat, Peter. Listen, just jump in there, Peter. I got places for you to go, Peter. I need you to go to these people over here. Peter's like, okay, okay, Lord, finally, okay, I'll go. You know what Peter didn't want to do? What I don't want to do? Peter didn't want to go where he thought the investment wouldn't bring a return. Peter had decided who was worthy of the investment. Peter had said, I don't like the way you dress. I don't like the way you smell. I don't like the company you keep. Oh, you look friendly. Oh, you look like you'll receive me. And so Peter said, that's who I'll go to. And God said, wow, Peter, we got a lot to learn, my son. A lot to learn. Peter took his little teeny tiny net. Maybe he just took a fishing pole with one worm. He's like, I hope I catch one. And God's like, where's the dragnet? Peter, we got to catch some fish. Look at Luke 10. This is where we get caught up. This great parable. A certain, a certain lawyer stands up and tested him saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Said to him, what is written in the law? I like it. He's asking for himself. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers him with how he should live. Because, yeah, that will bring him eternal life, right? He says, what's written in the law? What is your reading of it? And he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, you've answered rightly. Do this and you will live. That should have been the end of the conversation. He said, go cast your net far and wide and you'll live. But this is where I get caught. Verse 29, he says, but he wanting to justify himself, said, Jesus, who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Who, who should I give to you? Lord, how will I have discernment on who to give to you? He says, Jesus, like this, like, ah, ah. Just imagine, like, who's my neighbor, Lord? Who's worthy of the investment? Arrogance that he has. But don't we do that? We get caught up. I'm not going to invest in them. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to spread the word that way. I don't know if the return will be any good. I don't want to cast my pearl before swine. All right, I'm a little discernment. I was thinking about that when I was putting this together. I thought, I know that someone will want to come talk to me. And say, well, what about, you don't just share the word with everybody. What about, what about that person who, who's just oh, the swine? We're going to cast our pearls before them. That's such a small percentage. We'll get to that in a second. Listen, look at, look at what Paul says to his, his letter to the church at Corinth. He's going to quote Psalm 112. He's going to bring this powerhouse message to the people of Corinth. Because they're struggling with this same problem right now. They're like, we pick and choose. Jesus, we don't do work there. We don't do work there. He's like, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 13. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully, right? That's what we're talking about. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound for a Jew, that you always have an all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Whoa, what? If I'm working out of my daddy's wallet, if I'm reaching back around to his wallet and saying, I need some more money, I have sufficiency in all things and an abundance for every good work. If I'm relying on my resources and my money, I'm going to run out real quick, real quick. Paul's, Paul's telling him, listen, you're, you're gathering resources from the wrong place. Verse 9, as it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor his righteousness into his forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food 
Supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. Here's the clincher of verse 13. Listen very carefully. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for your obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ, right? Because I said it. The obedience of my confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. So listen, you've taken God's word and you've not been selective. He said, they, they love that you love Jesus, the people you're sharing with, but just as much you're winning them over because they see you're sharing, you're giving, you're doing for all men, liberally, for all men. You have not selected. You have been those who have sown abundantly. And so therefore you have reaped abundantly. God's call has always been about getting that gospel out to all people, to all people. And he's chosen us because really that percentage of who we don't share with is so small. There's so many arguments today out there that are from the margin, right? There's a real hot topic on right now. Most of you probably have seen it. And it's an argument from the side of sin, from the margin. They say things like, well, what about in this scenario? What about in this? We should make something illegal, but what about this? What about that? The half of a half of a half of a half of a percent of a times that might apply? Well, I'm not going to cast my pearl before swine. Who are you deeming swine? Jesus only deemed one set of people swine. Those are the religious leaders that says, I love Jesus Christ, and I have the way to truth. Come and give me money and I might share it to you. Jesus said, don't go to them. Don't go to them. Don't cast, don't cast your pearls before them. They're just going to turn and trample you. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, those who said, we have the key to eternal life. Yet they were wicked. They were whitewashed tombs. Those are the only people in the Bible Jesus ever shows his anger towards physically. The only people he ever rebukes publicly in a harsh way. Whoa! Brood of vipers. That's only to the religious elite and those who were twisting his word. Everybody else, the woman caught in adultery, the sinner this, the sinner that, Jesus says, go and sin no more for sure. But they don't condemn you? Neither do I. Listen, it's grace and mercy. We are to go and just spread it out. Imagine if Jesus was just walking down the street. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not sharing my truth with you. Oh, definitely not with you. How picky. How picky. But he came for the regular Joes like you and me. He came for everybody. And he's telling us to do the same. Look at Luke 5. After these things, he went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he left all. He rose up and followed him. And Levi gave a great feast to his own house. Check out who was there. There was a great number of tax collectors and others who sat with them. Are you stuck in a sin? Were you once stuck in a sin? Was there some, were you an alcoholic? Were you a, a slanderer? Were you a homosexual? Were you a sorcerer? I have three different people in my life that claim they practiced witchcraft at one time in their life. Runes and spells and I worship trees and I've sacrificed animals. When that person, when that sexual deviant, when that slanderer, when that abuser, when that drug addict gets called by Christ and they come to Christ, like Levi the tax collector, and they get up, everybody else stuck in that sin who really does want a way out. Don't forget, deep down, nobody wants that in their life. He got up and did it, and all of a sudden they're like, how did he do it? How did he do it? They wanted to come have that too. Don't forget about those who are watching you, those who you can rescue. As God rescues you, those who are in the same sin will want it. And who's gathered up in his house? A great number of tax collectors. Like, what's he doing? What's Levi up to? I really don't want to be a turncoat on my people either. People will hate me. I'm a tax collector. And they came and they sat down. And the scribes and Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of physicians, but those who are sick. 
I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They didn't even know they were sick. They didn't know they were sick. Or worse yet, they said, we don't believe you when you tell us we're sick. We went through a great piece of scripture last night at home, my kids. We got to the end of what we're reading in Luke. And he said, there's the blind man, right, who comes from birth. He's blind. And I love it. Jesus takes so much advantage. He comes and, and they walk by and his disciples said, who sinned? Jesus, him or his parents that he's blind. Jesus is like, you got it all wrong. Neither him or his parents. But that the good works of God might be revealed in him. God allowed this tragedy so he could do good. And then when, he's, when he can see again, he goes before the Pharisees and like, how did you get your sight back? He says, I don't know. A man came and made mud, put up my eyes, and went and washed, and all of a sudden I could see again. He's like, how did he do it? He's like, I was blind when he did it. I don't know how he did it. I just told you. He made some mud, I think, and I think he rubbed it on my face, told me to do something. Literally, no, Jesus spat and made the mud. I wonder what he would have thought. Good thing he couldn't see. And then they're like, go get his parents. And his parents come in, and they were scared to death, because if they had said anything, they would have been kicked out of the synagogue. So like, he's of age, he's of age, ask him. And they come to him again. He says, I already told you. And I love his last line, the third time they question him. Why, do you want to be his disciples too? Is that why you want to know? And they, in outrage, they're like, how dare you school us? We are the teachers of God's word. And they cast him out. They turned and they trampled him. Don't waste your time with him. Now that man had a calling and he went and followed it. These are, these are the people. These are the ones standing outside Levi's house saying, why are you eating with him? And they pulled out their dragnets. It was like this big. They were like, Yee. right? That's not what God has called us to do. We, like Christ, we're after the drunkard. We're after the sorcerer, the deviant, the liar, the thief, the adulterer, the lazy, the slanderer, the good for nothing. That's who we're after because that's who all of us are without Christ, and he came for us. <clears throat> Boy, I am thankful that his dragnet went all the way to the bottom of the lake that I was drowning in, all the way to the bottom. Because if it hadn't, I would have missed it. And it must have got pulled up. I don't know how many times it got pulled up. And every time it got pulled up, Jesus looked in the net and said, nope, you missed one. Put it down again. At some point, I, <laughs> at some point I came up with that net. I'm so thankful start closing up on this and invite Cindy to come up as we prepare to just spend a moment with, with our Lord in communion. But I want to close up on, on these last two thoughts. Look at this parable. Matthew 22. Talk about scraping the bottom of the barrel. Jesus said to his servants, the wedding is ready. I'm sorry, then he said, he's telling this parable about this wedding feast. But those who are invited are not worthy. So listen, those who claim they know me, they're not worthy. They're not coming in. Therefore, go into the highways. As many as you can inf- Find, invite them to the wedding. So the servants went out into the highways and they gathered together all whom they found, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Stop right there. That finishes the extent of our job as believers. That's it. It was to go out and get them in. It was to go out and gather them. Not to say, I'm not going behind that building or down that alley. Jesus said, listen, I want you to drag the bottom of the lake. At this point, there's certain gospels that say, I want you, the highways, the byways, you go out in the bushes and kick over rocks and cans. Where are they at? Bring them all in. I didn't ask you to decide who to bring to the feast. I said, bring them all to the feast. And like we talked about in the very beginning, right at the end of time, it says, then the angels will come and sort. Look at the rest. But when the king came to see his guest, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without the wedding garment? And he was speechless. This man we invited in, and he played church. And you and I didn't know any better. He played church for 20 years. Don't worry. Don't worry for God. Don't spend your days thinking God might miss the sinners. God might not know who the really bad are. So I'm not going to invite them in because God might miss them. I don't want that person in our church because I'm afraid God might, God might not understand how bad they are. Well, there's the door. Whoever's first to walk out, let's do it, because none of us deserve to be here. Let's go. We were invited in. And then he comes, and he says, Where, how'd you get in here? You didn't have the wedding garment. Verse 13, then the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into the outer darkness. 
where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. That's the moment when God calls us now. Now, now we've done our work. We've purported the gospel. We've lived our life in Christ. The end has come, and we just got the gospel to everybody. And Jesus says, yeah, but we have a problem now. Because that one, that one, that one, and that one, they didn't really know me. And then he'll call us to throw them out, and it'll be a sad moment. But then there'll be eternity. I'm just going to close up on, on Jesus' example. Look at, the, look at the 12. Look at the 12. He goes out, and he calls them all. In Luke 6, we see where Jesus calls them all by name. He's got all his disciples with him, and he goes out, and he calls them all. After this night of prayer, he's with everybody, and he says, I need to call out my own. In verse 13, when it was day, he calls his disciples to himself. And from them he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and his Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became the traitor. You ever think about who Jesus called? The, the people he called? What if as he was walking down the street to gather his people in, he was like, hey, oh, not James and John. You guys are too violent, right? They wanted to call down fire. How about, you? oh, oh, not Thomas. Sorry, you're going to end up doubting. You're not welcome in the group. All right, you got, oh, oh, uh, not Judas. You're going to betray me. I'm trying to figure out who would have picked. Peter? Like the, the king of, of insert foot in mouth? Who would he have picked? If Jesus picked knowing what was coming and still picked, cast that net far. Who do we share the gospel with? Who do we go out and gather into his kingdom? And trust that he's going to figure it out. Right here he knows. We're not waiting for Jesus to figure anything out. Here he knows. Believer, I caution us. Don't take the easy road. Don't just spend time with the 99. Go out and get the one. Go grab a hold of him just like Christ did for each one of us.